tonight's word has an assignment on it. Like there's a specific God-ordained reason why we're about to hear the passage that we're going to read. Because you see, I didn't pick the passage. And if I'm going to be honest, it wasn't my preference. But Matthew 28 was the assignment. And how many of you understand that there is an anointing that comes from submitting to a God assignment? There's not just a get it done, I finished it, now I can go on to the next thing anointing. But there's a bend with your knees, wrap your arms around it, put it on your back, and carry that thing to the finish line kind of anointing when we finish a God assignment. So I want to ask you guys to do me a favor. Because when I wasn't sure, God gave me a confirmation last night. I got a late night phone call that I was not expecting from somebody I haven't talked to in a very long time. And you know when you get that call and the, and the name pops up and you're like, uh-oh, what's going on? That part. So I want to ask you guys to stand up for this word, for the reading of God's word. Can you guys stand with me for just one moment and then we're going to pray and you guys can sit back down. Because you see, this is a special passage. This is Matthew 28, 16 through 20. This is the Great Commission. And the Great Commission is God's assignment to the church. We're the church. Every single person from the stage all the way to the cameras, to the back row over there against the wall, guess what? This is your assignment. Come on. I'm going to read it, though. I'm going to read it. <laughs> then the 11 disciples left for Galilee, going to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshiped him. But some of them doubted. Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go. Go. And make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And be sure of this. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Heavenly Father God, we just come before you right now in the hearing of this word. And Lord, let it burn in our hearts like those men on the road to Aramaeus. When they walked with you, when they heard your voice, God, right now I ask that your word would begin to penetrate hard hearts, that it would begin to heal broken hearts, that it would begin to climb over the walls that have resisted breakthrough. Those that have been bound, we command to be freed in the atmosphere right now. Lord, this is your place. These are your people, and we want your assignment for our lives. So speak, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You can be seated. So like I get this call last night, right? <laughs> you thought I was going to just keep going. No. I get this call last night from my cousin. And if I'm going to be honest, in my family, we don't necessarily have a culture of being close. But me and this cousin... No matter how many times I moved, no matter what was going on, we always kept reconnecting. And even if it had been years in between, we would just pick up like it was yesterday. Now both of us grew up similar homes. His dad was a gang member. Um, his dad basically, was, you know, was gone when he was very young, was raised by his stepdad. And um, it, it was just kind of like a little bit rough. You know, his mom was always worried he was going to turn out to be just like his dad. Um, 
You know, I grew up in not a, you know, the best environment. But the one thing we both had was that we would go to church. We had church, you know, um, and we had each other. But fast forward and, you know, we both ended up just wilding out, backsliding. And, and me and my cousin actually used to go, we'd go, you know, partying and, and we'd go hanging out all over the place. So he's seen me grow up. He's seen me backslide. He's seen me get my life right with Jesus and get married and turn it all around. And about five years ago, my cousin finally settled down and got married. Four years ago, he became a dad. But the thing was, he was living in Colorado, and I was like, okay, dude, you got it. You're good now. And life happened, and we got far apart. So when he called me up last night to tell me he was in the middle of a divorce, when he called me up last night to tell me he was broken and confused, and it wasn't just over the marriage, but he didn't know if there was a God. And if there was a God, why did God bother to create him if he knew how it would all end up? Now immediately I'm jumping into, you know, like saving, life-saving measures for this marriage. And I think that I'm going to go marriage counseling on him. And God stops me and says, Wr. he can't do this marriage covenant until he learns how to have covenant with me again. He's too broken. She's too broken. There's been too much hurt. And you can't love unconditionally without the love of Jesus. So he said, you're going to have to show him I'm real. And I was like, God, really? Like, not, not in a bad way, but like, whoa. You know, you ever stop and be like, all my life was for this? Like, every time, I'm always surprised. I think it's for this moment. Like, tomorrow's going to be a new one. But, but yesterday... My whole life, like literally right in all the curriculum for Leadership University that I did, every lesson that I've taught, every sermon that I've listened, everything was for that moment. And I said, I'm going to give him everything. Like I'm going to pray for this brother. Like I'm going to stand the gap for him. Like I've got the scriptures. Like I know the Holy Spirit. I'm going to bind up the enemy and push back the gates of hell for my cousin. You see, the Great Commission hits different when, it, when it's close to home. So you can get complacent with it because it's not your brother. It's not your wife. It's not your kids. It's not your neighbor. But last night God knocked on my door. And he said, they don't know me. Everything shifted. And now when I read Matthew 28, it had a whole different impact. That's why I asked you to stand. Because it's an impartation and instruction. And if we don't get it, the church don't grow. People don't get saved. Lives aren't transformed. Marriages aren't restored. The darkness doesn't get pushed back. The truth isn't declared. So I don't need a whole bunch of amens tonight, but I definitely need you to receive the instructions for your assignment. And then I need you to get passionate about being about it. In your home, in your workplace, everywhere you go. That's the place to fulfill your assignment. All right, we got three contrasts now. And I know I'm just throwing that out so it sounds like where are we going. We're about to break down this passage. And I'm going to show you the choices you have to make along the way to becoming something that God ordained for you to be. See, every single one of you is ordained. That means chosen by God, written down in the books of heaven. To be a disciple maker. Did you hear me though? A, a disciple maker. Just wait till we break that part down. So number one, section one. <laughs> you know, I have four sections, sorry. <laughs> section number one. You know, when I'm reading that passage, it started out a little bit funny. Because it said 11 disciples. I thought Jesus had 12 You ever just stop and think about that? 
Do you ever stop and look on your row at church? You know where you, you know how we all sit in the same spot all the time? And then all of a sudden you stop seeing somebody that you used to see? Or, or maybe in your discipleship group, they're not, they're not answering the group text anymore. They didn't show up. Maybe you're a growth coach. And halfway through, they stopped showing up to Holy Warriors too. There were 11 disciples, not 12. They went to make Jesus on the mountain. See, Matthew twenty two fourteen 14 says that many are called, but few are chosen. And somewhere along the way, some Calvinistic predestination teaching made us, get, like, twist that passage into an excuse. Oh, he called, but, he, I, I mean, I'm saved, but, you know, that's what the called means. It means an invitation. I'm saved, but, you know, I'm not chosen to be part of a discipleship group. I'm not chosen to evangelize and to adopt a block. You know, I'm not necessarily the kind of person that should be leading a ministry. You know my background? Oh, those were all the things I thought. When, when me and my husband, right, we, we first got married and we're here at the way, and they had all these classes, right? And so they, you know, had starting at the way and serving at the way and giving at the way and all that, right? And guess, you know what the last class was in the series? Anybody but way back 20, 15, 20 years ago? Leading at the way. And my husband and I said, okay, we're done with our discipleship. And he said, no, we have one more class. I said, no, we don't. <laughs> he said, yeah, we have the leading class to finish. And I said, I will never be a leader at the Way World Outreach. Won't he do it, though? <laughs> See, this word chosen means that, that I answered the call. It means the quality. It means, oh, you want me to do this? I'm going to do it. it. It means when somebody says, hey, would you like to attend my discipleship group on Thursday night at 7? Yes. It means, would you like to attend the growth conference this June in order to change your life for Jesus? The answer is? Yes. Thank you. It doesn't mean stay in your seat. See, he said, go make disciples, not make church attendees. Uh oh. I hope I didn't step on your toes. But we get real comfortable just going to church. Like, you get saved, you get off drugs, you stop sleeping around and finally get married, and then you think it's all said and done. But God wants you to know, I did all that so you could go. Be disciples do what Jesus told them to do. See, I think this was interesting, right? It's that, like they went, like, we're going to go to Galilee to the mountain just like Jesus told us. But we have one little hiccup. See, earlier in Matthew 28, when Jesus resurrects, he comes out of the tomb. Were the disciples on the road to Galilee? No. There's some Bible scholar right around here somewhere. You got all the answers. Praise the Lord. I'm like, whoa, a leadership university. We start in July. Um, but <laughs> this is the thing, guys. They weren't on the way. They were hiding. Jesus comes out of the tomb, right? He's over there by the grave, and he sees two women waiting. He's like, okay, all I got left out of all my crew is these two, and they're waiting. Nobody's going. So he says, Mary, Mary, what I need you to do is go find the brothers. That's, Jesus is so cool. He's like, go find the brothers. I love NLT. He's like, go find the brothers and tell them to meet me in Galilee. So these girls are like, I will I've been waiting to tell him all day. Good. <laughs> Peter just runs his mouth. Let me tell him. So the reason why is because God gave those women an assignment to tell those disciples they're out of position to get in position and get back on assignment. So I'm here to let you know God didn't send two, but he sent one really loud little brown girl to tell you, get back 
on assignment. See, exposure to information means nothing without application. You know how many people I counsel that are in, in, in church services saying amen and not doing it at home? And they come back, I went to church, nothing changed. But what did you do? See, because you could be a follower, you could be a believer and not be a disciple. Disciples do what Jesus tells them to do. And so, what did he tell them to do? He said, go to Galilee. And I think it was crazy. So, if, you know, Bible scholar, wherever you're at over here. Um, if you could find this, let me know. I would love to know this. So, so in he, right here, it says that they went to Galilee, to the mountain where God told them to go, where, where Jesus told them to go, right? And I'm like, wait a minute. I've done read all the Gospels. I have not seen that. Like, when did he say go to the mountain? Like, I heard him say, go to Galilee. But what, what is this, the mountain? Like, where did it come from out of nowhere? Like, where is meet me on the mountain in Galilee? But they knew to meet him on the mountain when he said, go to Galilee. See, that word mountain, you know, it, it, it's oros, and that means mountain. So I had to dig a little deeper. I'm like, well, what else does it mean? It means to rise. <laughs> It's also like a, like a Jewish proverb that means to accomplish most difficult, stupendous, incredible things. Oof. Turn to your neighbor and say, it's time that you accomplish some difficult, stupendous, incredible things. I hope you can remember that. Can they put it on the screen? I don't know. It's on. I'll wait five minutes. Are we still going? Okay. Praise the Lord. All right. Round of applause. You guys did it. Mission accomplished. Woof. That was hard for all of us. All right, so, so this is the thing. He's saying, I know you're low and depressed and you think everything is failing, but I need you to rise up because I didn't say meet me in the valley. I said meet me on the mountain. <laughs> and the mountain is like this mountain metaphor that's all over the Bible, right? And, and, and when I'm looking at it, I was just like, whoa. We need to see past what we see right now to see what he's saying in the season. And the mountain is going to give you that vantage point. See, see, mountains are what? They got height. It's a mountain because it's way up there. You know, sometimes I'm like, all these mountains. And my husband's like, those are hills. And I'm like, oh, well, they're all mountains to me. Anything over five feet tall is a mountain. Praise the Lord. <laughs> when you're this short, it was <laughs> trust. It means height. It means ascension. It means I was down here and I've got to go up there. And it's going to take effort. See, has anybody ever gone on a hike? You know, you can walk like five miles straight like nothing. You're like just marching and talking and eating chips. You go five miles out of, well, I eat chips when I walk, sorry. <laughs> but you go, right, you, you go on a hike up a mountain, you go five minutes and you're like, whoo, can we take a break? Like my husband is very adventurous. God bless his soul. We love him. But when I go on vacation, I want a vacation. He thinks, what, how many things can we get done in the next 24 hours without killing ourselves? It's like a competition. And so one morning, he wakes me and my daughter up. We're over here in like Baja, California. And he's like, you guys, I found a hike. Okay, bye. He's like, get up, it's going to be great. Look at the views. And I'm like, mm, I like the view of my bed right now. It's great. <laughs> no, I should have listened to the Holy Spirit at that point. But I put my tennis shoes on, put on my biker shorts, and we headed out. We are climbing up this mountain, and I am not lying to you. It is life-threatening. There are cactuses everywhere. And for some weird reason, they bought a pack of wild dogs. Talk to him about it later. But along the way, people started literally turning back. People started giving up. People were exhausted. People were fatigued. They could not physically do it anymore. And even when we reached the top, there were some people, I'm not lying, they left there because they couldn't climb back down. They were done. They had to call a helicopter probably to pick them up. 
See, it's going to take so much effort. Earlier, Pastor Marcos was telling us, right, that your growth isn't going to happen in, in your comfort zone. It's not in the convenient place. And this is the thing. He said there's limited seats, right? Do you know that fewer people live in the mountains than in the cities? Like I looked this up, right? And it's not just like, oh, you know, 60-40. 94% of Californians live in a city right now. That means less than 5% are willing to live up in the mountains. They're the minority group. There's not as many of them. But they're going to have views. They're going to see sunrises. They're going to have experiences that we don't get to have down here. We can't see it. They, when you go up to the mountains in Big Bear, guess what you can see? The stars. They're there. You know, you go in your backyard, you probably don't see them. I get it. But they're going to see what you can't see. See, God used a metaphor, but he also used a literal mountain in the Old Testament of a mountain experience. He said, this is where I meet with people. I'm calling you to the mountain to give you instructions. I'm calling you to the mountain to increase your vision, to show you what it could be, even though you have circumstances that says it can't be. So I want you to pause. Pause in your walk. And survey your surroundings. Are you waiting by gravesides? Are you wandering in wildernesses? Or are you willing to climb the mountains? How many people in the room right now? Raise your hand if you attend a DG. You are in a discipleship group right now. Whew. How many of you now? Are discipleship leaders. All right. Did you, did you see the difference there, guys? Like we had like 85% of the room raise their hand, I'm a disciple. And then 12 people said, but I'm leading them all. <laughs> we need help. See, this message is for somebody in the room, somebody watching online, somebody who's going to watch a month from now. And this message is saying to you, it's not enough anymore, not in this season, just to attend. It's not enough anymore just to believe, okay? It's time that we rise up, that we go to a higher vantage point, and we start to see ourselves like the leader, like the disciple maker he ordained for us to be. And I'm going to keep going. This is the thing here. I got two more contrasts here now in um, verse 17. See, the Bible says, when now when these disciples, you know, they were slow to go, right? They had some issues, but the women said, get up and go, you know? And they did it. And when they showed up, right, it says when they saw him, they worshiped. See, they thought he was dead. They thought he was gone. They thought that Rome had won and that all of them were, meant, were just wanted men and it had all meant nothing. And then they saw him. And maybe you had a moment in your life, right, when everything was falling apart and you didn't think it was going to work and then God showed up in your situation. See, that word saw has three different meanings. The first one is like literally to see with your eyes. And for some of us, we need Jesus to literally show up in our lives. Right now, you can go to, not, 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 not right now, like after service. But you can go to a site called IFoundTheTruth.com. And, and there's this major revival happening in the Muslim world. And you know what's happening? People are literally seeing Jesus. There's a man in white that is showing up and he's saying, I died for you. I love you. Follow me. And his name is Jesus. And they are worshiping him. They are going against great opposition. I heard the testimony of one man said, and he goes, Dad, if it's between you and Jesus, I choose Jesus. I was, whew. I was wrecked because for some of us, if it's between Jesus and Netflix, mmm. Right? And these people are like literally willing to lose everything and risk their lives. Because why? They saw him. 
Number two, what's another way to see? To see with the mind, to perceive or to know. What is this? Like it's understand. Like, oh, I see. I get it, right? And just like my cousin, when we're on the phone, like we are going in circles. When I say, oh, no, cousin, it's not about the marriage right now. It's about your relationship with Jesus. He's like, oh. He's like, I've talked to pastors. Like, Christy, I grew up and it was shoved down my throat my whole life. They took all of us to church and look what was happening. I said, cousin, that dysfunction wasn't Jesus. Mm -mm, Don't put that label on him. People have failed. People mess up. There is sin in this world. But Jesus came to save us. Jesus came to forgive us. And Jesus has made a way for us. See, in 1 Peter 3.15 in the ESV, it says, But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy. Always. If I had a physical Bible, I would circle that. Not just when you're at church, but when you're at a family function. Not just when you're in your discipleship group, but at work, in the grocery store, everywhere that you go, always, right, be prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. You've got to be ready. That means you would have taken the time to study God's word. You know it. You've hidden it in your heart. And you are prepared to give an answer. Today my husband was sharing with me. He went to another church. And he went to invite them to the growth conference. And he's talking to them. And they said, oh, we have a question. Are you uh, gender neutral and gender affirming? And he's like, we're affirming, but we're not neutral. He said, our pastor loves everybody. They're all welcome. Come on in. And we believe that when they hear the truth of God's word, that their mind will be renewed, their lives transformed, and they will know Jesus. He was prepared. See, some of us walk in and be like, well, well, Jesus loves you? And I'm not putting you down, but what I'm saying is take the time to prepare for the answers, for the questions that are coming. The last one is the third way that we see is to become acquainted with by experience. You know what that's called? Relationship. See, when you spend time with somebody, you get to know how they really are. Yes, I'm always loud when I talk. Yes, it's true. I'm a firstborn. I always think I'm right. Yes. <laughs> this is the thing, guys. There's two ways that we experience a relationship that is going to bring us to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Number one is an intimate relationship with Jesus. Like, like you're in worship. You hear God's word. And he shows up. You feel him. You know it. Like, that's God. I can't deny it. You know, there's people um, that are getting saved all by themselves in a room. Why? Because they read God's word and it transformed their hearts. God, Jesus, showed up. And number two is in a community of believers. That means you having relationship with people. See, this is the thing. You know how you become a disciple maker? You make disciples. You know how you make disciples? You share the gospel of Jesus Christ with them. See, we're going to run out of disciples if we don't evangelize. It all goes together. But the Bible says some doubted. It always kind of breaks my heart. Like we're like, yes, they finally got it together. They're worshiping. But even out of the 11, the Bible says some doubted. And maybe you're in the room right now with some doubt. Like you're showing up and you're like, I'm not sure about the church thing. I don't know about, about Jesus being the only way. Maybe you've heard some philosophies and and you've read some science stuff, right? And my cousin's giving me all this kind of different things, right? All these different angles. And I'm coming right back. I'm like, oh, I know a Christian philosopher. Do you know God's about science? God has the, like, hydrologic water cycles written in the Bible before they even made it. Do you know that God knew about microscopes before we found out? It's in the Bible. Everything's seen. It's made above the unseen. He's like, well, oh, oh. 
I said, God's not against science. He created it. It's subject to him. I had an answer. You believe me because you have seen me. But blessed are those who believe me without seeing, John 20, 29. See, that's powerful right there, okay? Because right now, God wants us to bring people to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And he's saying, they don't have to have a physical face-to-face encounter with me. Because even those that did doubted. So if you are in this room experiencing doubt, come on. You've never seen him, but you're going to. There's a scripture that has been just like sticking in my, in my spirit, you know, for about two weeks. And it's um, Hebrews 10.36. And I want to just give it to you guys. I really would love for you guys to actually meditate on this scripture because I believe it's a scripture for the season. And in Matthew 10.36, he says, for you, and this is a New King James Version. He says, for you, say, that's me, have need of endurance. So that after you have done the will of God, not before, after, is it, right? You may receive the promise. See, this is the thing. When doubt comes in like a wave, when doubt tries to take you out, because this doubt is the same thing that Peter struggled with, Jesus called Peter out of a boat. And that brother was walking on water until when? He saw the waves, took his eyes off of Jesus, and he began to sink. See, he started, but he didn't have the endurance to finish. Because that's what doubt does. It makes you sink. It makes you stop. But when we have endurance, we hit the finish line. Amen? All right, all right. Okay. I'm going to go forward because we have seven minutes. I want to get to the end. The next contrast was found over here in verse 18. When Jesus announces to his disciples that he was given, that means granted or gifted, all authority. See, maybe for you it's not doubt. Maybe for you it's warfare. Maybe you're in the fight of your life right now. Maybe there's things coming at you from three different directions, bigger, stronger, and mightier than you, that have been intimidating you, that are telling you you can't do it. But just the other week, Pastor Mike was telling us that Jesus broke the seal and rolled the stone because there's nothing that can keep him from showing up. He has all authority. That means power of rule or government. It also means the power of him, Jesus, whose will and commands must be submitted to by others and obeyed. This is a universal declaration of authority. Everyone, everywhere, no matter what, physics submits to Jesus. Psychology submits to Jesus. Your money submits to Jesus. Your boss has to submit to Jesus. The government has to submit to Jesus. The doctor's, um, you know, prognosis over you submits to Jesus. The pain and sickness in your body has to submit to Jesus. The warfare for your marriage has to submit to Jesus because he is sovereign over it. See, because it could be really hard to stay on assignment when you're in warfare. And the enemy's going to give you a million excuses why you should bow out. But you got to tell that devil, guess what? God's got me. I'm going to stay on assignment. We're at the climax here, verse 19. You guys, we have gone through three scriptures. And they have given us three amazing focuses. Number one, Jesus came and he's meeting you on the mountain. He's made an appointment with you. You have a place that you're assigned. Number two, it's time to stop doubting and start worshiping. Number three, Jesus has all authority, so don't worry about whatever is trying to intimidate you or fight with you. Therefore, go. 
Because Jesus did all of that for you. Because he is all of that for you. Because he is the way maker, the mountain mover, you can go. And when we go, we're going to make disciples of all nations. That means we have just been given, in verse 19 and 20, a universal process that is multicultural, multi-generational, and timeless on how to make disciples. So I don't care if you have a sixth grade graduation um, education or a, a college diploma. I don't care if your second language is English or if your first language is Hebrew. I don't know who has that. <laughs> I don't care what country you're in, what country you're from. Guess what? This process works for all of us. That word make in the like regular dictionary means cause something to exist or come about, bring about to form something by putting parts together or combining substances. It means to construct or to create. Simply put, you don't recruit a disciple. You recruit a believer and make them a disciple. So you model it in front of them. You teach it to them. You do life with them. You keep them accountable. You water the seeds of God's word. You impart into them everything God has given you. You love and you lead. See, this is a process of reduplication. And what is that? Simply put, when Jesus saved you, he said, give me your old self. And the new self I'm giving you are my robes of righteousness. You get to walk in my authority. You get to declare in my name. So guess what? Jesus has duplicated himself in us. We are a reflection of him. We are his ambassadors. And everything Jesus has done in your life, he's asking you to duplicate in somebody else's life. Three components of making a disciple. Number one. Baptize them. Yes, it's an immersion in water. Yes, it's a sign of removal of sin. And yes, okay, it, it means I'm saved and I want the whole world to know about it. Okay? But this is the thing. I'm compelled in my spirit, within myself, to be baptized. I want the world to know. I'm not just doing it to check off a list. I'm not just doing it because everybody else is. It's not a, a religious act that means I'm saved. It means I'm saved and I want the world to know. And I am forever going to be different because of my experience with Jesus. Baptism like that. Because you can get wet and come out and not be a disciple. Get the shirt, go home, and fold it up and never use it again. Number two, second component is teach them to obey. Yes, I use the word obey. Everybody calm down. See, obedience is better than sacrifice, and submission is better than the offering of fats of rams. This is, this is from 1 Samuel, okay? And God hasn't changed his heart or perspective on that. He wants your obedience. In Deuteronomy chapter 8, right in the beginning, he said, I'm the one who took you into the wilderness all those years to check your heart to see if you would what? Obey me. And in John 14, 15, it's my love language scripture. It says, if you love me, this was Jesus talking to his disciples, if you love me, obey my commandments. See, obedience is a sign not just of submission but of love. It means I know who my leadership is. I know who's in charge. I know I'm the disciple and I am following Jesus Christ. Teach your disciples to do the same thing. And number three, be sure that I am with you always. See, it's hard to be the disciple of someone who's not there. So if you're a leader, if you're a discipleship group leader, be there. Be consistent. If you are a disciple, show up. Be consistent. See, because we're saying discipleship group isn't, it's not doing anything for me. Well, are you really doing discipleship group? Jesus said this, I am with you. That word with is, is the word meta. Sorry, Facebook, you didn't create it. 
and it means of Christ who is to be present with his followers by his divine power and aid. See, my cousin started trying to uh, defend his point, and, and he started talking to me about a box. He said, you see, there's this box, and, and it is the metaphoric, but there's a box, and, you know, I'm in the box, and it's my life, and the whole world is, like, in the box. And I said, okay, it sounds a little bit like metaphys metaphysics, quantum physics. What are you talking about? Go ahead. I got you. And he said, but you see, God is on the outside of the box, but he's looking in. And God can see everything that's happening in the box and everything that's going to happen in the box, right? God knows everything, right? And I'm like, okay, yeah. And he goes, but that's the thing. If he can see it, why didn't he stop the ugly things? I've seen evil things in this world, Christy. I've been hurt really bad. I've seen people get hurt really bad. And if God sees it all, why didn't he stop it? I said, there's such a thing, right? Yes, it's free will. But don't use that as like a, like a write-off. Every day, every one of us makes a choice to follow him or not, to worship him or doubt, to be called or to be chosen. Because, see, God didn't just call a lot of people and choose a few. The problem is he called many, but only a few answered. And there's something wrong with your little metaphor. See, God isn't outside of the box looking in. God's in the box with you. Right now, if you're in this room and you're struggling with doubt, you're struggling with unbelief, you have questions because some of the things you've experienced, I get it. I went to church, you know, I read the Bible, I went, I went to conferences with, with Joyce Meyer and, and, and um, all these people, and I was like, I heard it all. But why did my dad do that? Why didn't my mom stop him? How come I had to live that life? And I never stopped believing that there was a God, but I had stopped believing that God was with me. And we're going to have a time of prayer up here in just a little bit. But if you're wrestling, I want to invite you up here tonight because I want you to meet with him in this place. I want him to show you he's real, that he hears you and he sees you, that he is ready to respond, that he has been calling your name. And you may feel like you're all alone, but he hasn't given up on you. He's calling you back again. And if he had to send somebody to come out of nowhere and remind you that you're called, that you're chosen, and that you have an assignment on your life, today is the day. And if you're a disciple right now, and you have been discipling, I mean, attending your discipleship groups, but you've been afraid to take the next step. You've been afraid to step into the role of being a leader. You've been, you know, intimidated to ask somebody to attend a group you're leading because you feel like you're not qualified. And I want you to come up here tonight, too, because you saw the room. Not only were there more disciples and disciple makers in the room tonight, discipleship leaders tonight, but there were still hands that hadn't been lifted. They're still your family. They're still your neighbors, the people in your neighborhoods, right? And they need Jesus too. So if you'll stand with me tonight, or have the altar team come up right now. I don't want us to delay I don't want us to have to think about this. Remember I told you in the beginning, I didn't need a lot of applause. I didn't need any amens tonight. But I wanted something to stir in your heart. And if you have never met Jesus before, my prayer was that you heard him tonight. And that you hear him calling you right now. Because he died for you. He loves you and he's made a way for you. If you're in this place and you need Jesus, can you raise your hand? 
Can you answer the call? Can you let Jesus know that you heard him, that you're ready to respond, that you're ready to answer and come? Because he's come for you. We're going to take this second right now to invite those people up to the front. But discipleship leaders, I'm not done with you. (laughs) If you're a discipleship leader and you want more vision, see, sometimes we forget, right? We get stuck in a place of I've got here. But there's more vision, there's more growth, there's more to do for the kingdom because every day the darkness is expanding, every day lives are being lost. And when I say lives are lost, I mean people are walking away from God and they don't know him. If you're in this room and you want new vision, if you're in this room and you want a relationship with Jesus, If you're ready to take it to the next step and answer the call, then we invite you to come forward right now. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to invite Christian. He's going to come out here. He's going to pray with you guys. I think he's got some closing words. Come on, how many received that word tonight? Can we show some appreciation? Thank you, Christy, for the awesome word. Can we give God praise and thanks for the word he gave us tonight? Somebody say, go. It's time to us to go and to do what God has called us to do. And I'm so, I want to say this, I'm so proud of every person that came up here tonight that are making this decision to respond to this call. Now, there may be a few more out there that are saying, you know, I want to surrender my life completely to Jesus. I want to know if I were to die tonight that I'd spend eternity with God in heaven forever. Not because I'm a perfect person, because none of us are, but because I put my faith in Jesus Christ and I'm ready to surrender my life to Him and I want to be forgiven tonight. If you want to be up here and you're saying, that's me, I want to invite you. Make your way forward. There's still some time. Look, there's still some coming tonight, church. Give them a hand. There's still some people coming. Come on. This is where we get excited for all those that are making their way forward tonight. If we have a few more DG leaders that are out there, we have a, just a handful of people that need someone. Well, let's do this. If you came forward tonight and you're saying, I'm ready to take my next step and to grow on my walk, then... We have a plan for you. There's a class that's starting next, uh, uh, I believe it's next week actually, Holy Warriors classes. This is your next step. We're going to help you get baptized, just like we talked about tonight in scripture. But we're also going to teach you how to be a disciple of Jesus and how to make disciples of Jesus. So let's take your next step. Let's do it. The person in front of you, they're going to pray with you and they're going to sign you up for your next step. We have a few more people here uh, that just need some prayer, just a few more. Just want to make sure that everybody is covered. Thank you so much. Let's bow our heads tonight, and I want you to repeat this prayer after me. Say, Jesus, thank you for saving me. I was lost, a sinner, broken, but you loved me enough to give your life for me. But you didn't just die. I believe You resurrected from the dead so that I can be saved and set free. So from this point on, I am your child, making me a new heart, a new creation. Fill me with your spirit, and I'll never be the same again. My life belongs to you, Jesus. In Jesus' name I pray, amen, amen, and amen. Church, what an awesome night. This Sunday, we have a powerful message for you. Pastor Marco's bringing a word, and he's going to talk about growth, how we can grow, believing that God wants us to grow. Some powerful principles we're going to learn this Sunday. Be here Sunday to hear from Pastor Marco on how to grow. Invite somebody. Thank you, church, for being here on a Wednesday night. We got some great things coming up for you. If you need prayer, come forward.